This video is supported by The Great Courses Plus. Everybody loves rockets, am I right? Unless you're a Londoner in 1943. Because the first rockets were German death machines. The German V-2 rocket took the bombing of London to a terrifying new level. Now instead of risking planes and pilots, they could just launch a rocket from across the channel and there was nothing the Brits could do about it. The rockets pierced the edge of space and then plummeted toward neighborhoods below faster than the speed of sound, giving Londoners no way to defend against them, no warning whatsoever, and no escape. But all great things must first wear terrifying and monstrous masks in order to inscribe themselves on the hearts of humanity. Nietzsche. In fact, by the time the U.S. got serious about manned space missions, we were already cranking out intercontinental ballistic missiles like there was no tomorrow. Because if nuclear war broke out, there would be no tomorrow. So they thought maybe instead of putting a nuclear weapon on it, you put John Glenn on it instead. That's how we first started putting men into space. All the Mercury and Gemini missions were flown on modified ICBMs like the Redstone Atlas and Titan II rockets. The Saturn rockets of Apollo were the first ones that were built from scratch with manned flight in mind. And these were designed and built by Werner von Braun, the guy behind the V-2 rockets. All great things. But when SpaceX first got started, they didn't have nuclear weapons and Nazis to fall back on. They just had Elon Musk and maracas. Today, they're the most successful private space launch company in the world, pioneering new technologies to make spaceflight cheaper, more sustainable, and reigniting people's interest in space travel. How did they get here? And what comes next? While the Falcon Heavy is getting all the attention lately and definitely adds more functionality to SpaceX's services and we're looking forward to more Falcon Heavy launches later this year, it's the Falcon 9s that are the real tried and true workhorses of the SpaceX business model. Understanding how the Falcon 9 came to be gives you a real insight into the company's overall mission and gives you an idea of where they're going to be going in the future. Elon's number one priority with SpaceX is to make space travel more affordable, so the Falcon 9 was built from the beginning with reusability in mind. Now before some of you flip out in the comments, yes, I know his long-term strategy is to get humanity off this planet and make it a multi-planetary species starting with Mars, but that's an impossible thing to do as long as traveling up into space is prohibitively expensive. He wants to make spaceflight as cheap and routine as air travel. He makes the point that, you know, how expensive would it be to fly somewhere if every time you landed, they threw the plane away. That's basically what we do with space travel right now. I mean, the Saturn V is a marvel of engineering, but out of this entire thing, the only part that comes back to Earth is this. And even that's not reusable, which is one of the many reasons why we've never been back to the moon. If we're ever gonna get to Mars or have a lunar base, we have to have a vehicle that's reusable. So it all has to start with reusability. Actually, before you have reusability, you have to have usability. So the first one in the Falcon lineup is the Falcon 1. Falcon 1 did five flights from 2006 to 2009. It's a two-stage rocket standing 22 meters tall with a 1.5 meter diameter. And in case you were wondering, yes, Elon named it after the Millennium Falcon. But ace the Kessel Run, it did not. In fact, it had a pretty rough start. The first flight in March 2006 carried the Falcon Sat 2 satellite and began to pitch wildly 33 seconds after takeoff, eventually exploding. The second flight in March 2007 carried the Demosat satellite for DARPA, and it too failed, though it did have a successful first stage. The second stage engine cut off too early and didn't reach orbit. But unlike the first one, it was successful for long enough for them to gather a bunch of data, so Elon actually considered that one a mild success. Both the first two flights used the Merlin 1A engine, making it zero for two, and that would stay its record forever because it was never used again. Falcon 1 Flight 3 took off in August of 2008, this time with the Merlin 1C engine, which performed perfectly, but some residual fuel left at the time of the second stage separation caused the two to collide against each other and the mission failed. This one included a few satellites, including some nano satellites for NASA and, weirdly, a space burial for the company Celestis. What happens if you pay for a space burial and you don't get to space? Can you get your money back? Now, famously, this was the absolute make or break time for SpaceX. This entire venture was privately funded by Elon Musk. And with three failures under his belt, some of the contracts started to dry up and the money was running out. If they didn't make this next one work, they were going to go bankrupt. But one thing SpaceX does probably better than anybody else is they collect data. To this very day, every single launch, they collect a mountain of data and analyze it relentlessly, trying to find ways to improve the system. And they learned from these three failures. So just a couple of months later, with everything on the line, they finally got it right with the fourth launch of Falcon 1. This one didn't carry an actual payload, just a boilerplate to simulate the weight of a payload. At this point, they just basically needed to prove that it worked, so instead of putting more satellites on there, they were just gonna test this thing out. And it did work. They followed the exact same trajectory as the last one. The only change they made was that they altered the timing between the first stage separation and the second engine burn starting, and it worked. 
There was only one more flight of the Falcon 1 in July of 2009, and this one also nailed it, proving that the fourth launch wasn't just a fluke and actually putting a payload into orbit, the Razcat satellite. SpaceX was officially in the game. But the Falcon 1 was always more of a demonstration vehicle. It was always planned to move on to something bigger, and early on the plan was to move on to one called the Falcon 1E, but it was determined to be not necessary, so it was scrapped. And at one point there was a plan for a Falcon 5, which would have five engines on it, but that was also scrapped. Because what Elon wanted from the beginning was to slap nine of these suckers together and create a Falcon 9. The Falcon 9 had been in development since 2006 and was partially funded by a NASA program called the Commercial Orbitals Transportation Services, or COTS, program. This was designed to help fund the development of private launch vehicles to run resupply missions to the ISS. This first version of the Falcon 9, version 1.0, stood 47.8 meters tall, more than twice as tall as the Falcon 1, featured nine Merlin 1C engines that could launch 10,000 kilograms into low Earth orbit compared to 570 with the Falcon 1, which puts it in a class of rocket known as a medium heavy launcher. Version 1.0 is smaller than the rockets that would follow it and had no reusability whatsoever. The maiden launch of the Falcon 9 version 1.0 was on June 4, 2010. It carried a boilerplate Dragon capsule and got within 1% of its target orbit, which is pretty much as good as it gets for our first launch. So they were able to get something into orbit with the Falcon 9, that's good, but in order to be a part of the NASA COTS program, they needed to jump through a few hoops in order to get the contract to actually service the ISS. This would involve three missions. The first mission would prove that the Dragon capsule was structurally sound and capable in space. The second mission would perform a series of maneuvers that would bring the capsule within close range of the ISS and then prove some rendezvous capabilities. And the third mission would actually berth with the space station. The first mission was called Demo Flight 1, and it launched on December 8, 2010, carrying an operational Dragon capsule. Over the course of two orbits, they tested the attitude control through the Draco thrusters, the guidance, telemetry, navigation systems, and whatnot, before re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down near Mexico. And you can find this Dragon capsule proudly displayed in the SpaceX headquarters today. And fun fact, the dummy payload on that mission was a giant wheel of cheese. It'll be another 18 months before SpaceX got a shot at the Demo Flight 2, but in the meantime, they tried to convince NASA to let them combine Demo Flight 2 and Demo Flight 3, basically kill two birds with one stone. Basically, they were arguing that if Demo Flight 2 went well and all the rendezvous maneuvers went the way they were supposed to, why not just go ahead and try Demo Flight 3 and go ahead and dock with the space station? And eventually, NASA agreed to give it a try. On May 22, 2012, SpaceX launched Demo Flight 2, and over the next two days, it navigated toward the space station, performed its rendezvous maneuvers, tested its solar panels, grappling fixture, and proximity sensors, amongst other things. Having nailed all the procedures, NASA gave them a go, and SpaceX moved in on the space station. Once the capsule was about 9 meters away, astronaut Don Pettit grabbed the capsule with the station's robotic arm and pulled it in. By the way, this is what berthing is as opposed to docking. Docking is where two spacecraft directly connect with each other, and with berthing, they grab it with the robotic arm and pull it in. On May 26, they opened the hatch, and for the first time in history, a private spacecraft had docked with the space station. Don Pettit would later remark on how it had a new car smell. SpaceX was officially awarded a Commercial Resupply Mission Contract, or CRM contract, with 13 resupply missions to the ISS. This changed everything. The Falcon 9 version 1.0 had two more flights, making it five total. All of them were successful, and one of them actually had one of the engines go out in the launch, but the other eight made up for it, which proved the value of the redundancy in the engine design. But now that they proved that the Falcon Dragon system could do the job, now it was time to focus on the reusability issue. The next phase of the Falcon program was all about testing and perfecting the landing technique. So between 2012 and 2013, SpaceX developed two different vehicles, the Falcon 1.1, which is a larger version of the Falcon 9 with more fuel for landing, and a little thing called the Grasshopper. This was a test vehicle that was actually made out of version 1.0 spare parts, and it was tested out at the SpaceX facility in McGregor, Texas. Their goal with the Grasshopper was to perfect vertical takeoff and landing. They wanted to create a rocket that could land with the precision of a helicopter. Over the course of a year in 2012 and 2013, SpaceX engineers did a series of tests starting from just a three second hop to a 744 meter climb. They tested how to maneuver in the wind, they tested lateral movements and more to get their landing algorithms just right. At the same time, they built version 1.1, which was significantly larger than the 1.0. Standing 68 meters tall and 3.8 meters in diameter, or 12 feet in diameter, they also changed out the engines from the square configuration to a circular pattern they call the OctaWeb, which they've kept to this day. And the 1.1 used a new Merlin 1D engine that gave the vehicle over 5,800 kilonewtons of thrust or the ability to launch 13,000 kilograms, that's 28,000 pounds, into low Earth orbit. This might be a good time to talk about those Merlin engines. 
The Merlin engines use liquid oxygen, or LOX as the rocketeers call it, and a fuel called RP-1, which is basically a very refined kerosene. It's like jet fuel on steroids. Without getting too much into the weeds, it uses a pintle type injector, which is very similar to the lunar lander in the Apollo program, but it also has a recyclable fuel system so that you'll have a fail safe so you don't lose uh, vector thrust control just in case there's a hydraulic leak in the system. You know that problem. This design's been refined over the years and they named them 1A through 1D, but you might have noticed they skipped 1B because by the time the 1B was set to fly, they had made so many changes on it they just went ahead and changed the name to the 1C. They also did a vacuum version for the 1C and the 1D. These are made to perform better in the vacuum of space. The next step in SpaceX's engine design is the Raptor engine. This is a next generation engine that uses LOX and methane, these are both fuels that can be made on Mars with in situ resource utilization. The first version 1.1 launched in September 2013 and continued to be used until 2016. They launched a total of 15 flights, 14 of which were successful. They added landing legs for the first time in April of 2014 and then the grid fins first showed up in January of 2015. They tested landing the 1.1 over the ocean, sometimes just letting it come down to a stop on top of the ocean and then tipping over, sometimes trying to land it on a drone ship. None of these landings actually worked, but as SpaceX does, they collected a mountain of data and then applied that to the algorithm to make it better. Back in Texas, the Grasshopper was retired and followed by the Falcon 9 Reusable Development Vehicle or the F9R Dev. This one was built on a much larger 1.1 frame and it was used mostly to to test the grid fins and seeing if they could reach hypersonic velocity by taking up a thousand meters and dropping it. From all of these testing and trials, SpaceX built the next version of the Falcon 9 called the Falcon 9 Full Thrust, or sometimes called the Falcon 9 1.2, sometimes called the Falcon 9 Block 3. It has lots of names. This will be the first version of the Falcon 9 that we're going to actually try to land with upgraded computer and guidance systems and a super cooled fuel system which gave it 30% more thrust. And they decided on the maiden voyage of the Falcon Full Thrust to try landing back on land. And here's where things started getting interesting. The first launch of this new Falcon 9 model landed flawlessly. After nine years of development and launches with only expendable rockets, they finally pulled it off. And only four months later, they were able to land for the first time on a drone ship. And since then, they've been able to do it 22 out of 24 times. And on March 30th of 2017, they relaunched the first stage for the first time, showing that yes, they can be completely reusable. Incremental improvements led to the Block 4, which is their current model of Falcon 9. And in April, they're going to launch for the first time the Block 5, which should be the final version. The Block 5 is going to be designed to be more quickly reusable. SpaceX wants to eventually get to where they can turn around a rocket in just a few days. The biggest modifications in the Block 5 include stronger landing legs, a little bit more thrust, and a few modifications to make it a little bit more quickly reusable. And of course in February of this year they launched for the first time the Falcon Heavy which gives them the ability to launch heavier objects into higher Earth orbit and beyond. But the real story here is the reusability. The Falcon 9 is only 65% reusable because you can't reuse a second stage. And that's only when you can land the first stage. In a lot of cases, the deployment requires that you have to travel further down range, which doesn't leave enough fuel for a landing. The Falcon Heavy with its three Falcon cores is 90% reusable. You still lose that second stage, but the bulk of the machine is able to be used again. 90% is good. Better than any other rocket out there, or any other rocket ever for that matter. But SpaceX wants the whole enchilada. I mean, they're even trying to figure out how to recover the fairings. SpaceX has been playing with ideas to recover the second stage for years now, but it would either require a heavy and expensive heat shield for orbital re-entry or more fuel in a larger second stage to make it turn around and reverse and be able to land. It's just not really possible in a Falcon 9 system. What they need is some kind of big second stage that can turn around and land just like the first stage does. Something completely new, some new design, something big, some kind of big Falcon rocket. With all the hype about BFR going to Mars, what really gets overlooked is the reusability of it, which is actually the bigger point. Everything about the BFR is reusable. A large second stage capable of landing just like the first stage, capable of putting people into orbit, capable of putting payloads into orbit that doesn't even require fairings would be 100% reusable. So nothing is thrown away. The only cost is the fuel. This is why Elon said that the cost of launching on the BFR would be the lowest of any rocket in history, even though it is by far the biggest rocket in history. The BFR is the ultimate realization of the SpaceX vision. 
a large multi-purpose reusable rocket that makes space travel just as cheap as airplane travel and opens up the possibility of being a multi-planetary species. SpaceX is planning some grasshopper style tests on the BFR platform sometime in 2019 and the aspirational timeline of launching orbital flights in 2021 or 2022. In the meantime, Falcon 9 will continue to be the workhorse of the SpaceX lineup. There's over 40 launches on the manifest going all the way out to 2021, everything from cargo missions to the ISS to satellite deployment, and yes, manned missions, hopefully starting this year on the Dragon 2 capsule. This last Thursday marked the 50th launch of the SpaceX Falcon 9, 48 of which have been successful. That is a remarkable achievement, and let's just say it, a remarkable vehicle. Thanks for taking this trip down Falcon 9 memory lane with me. If you are as interested in the history of spaceflight as I am and want to take a deeper dive, I highly recommend The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus has thousands of lectures from top professors at Ivy League schools on pretty much any topic you can think of, from gardening to space travel, but I wanted to recommend a course by Dr. James Gregory called The Science of Flight. It covers all type of powered flight going all the way back to the Wright brothers through space launches and showing how they work. It really gives you a whole new layer of understanding that you can take with you the next time you watch a Falcon 9 launch. It'll also help you appreciate just how difficult this is and why their success is so remarkable. While you're there, you can also check out courses on history, music, health, philosophy, literally anything you can think of. It's pretty much the closest thing we have right now to just downloading Kung Fu from the Matrix. You can start your free trial if you sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash answerswithjoe. Give it a try. Your brain will thank you. Links down in the description. I want to thank The Great Courses Plus for supporting this channel, and I also want to give a shout out to the patrons on Patreon who are helping keep the lights on around here. It's not just supporting the channel, but you're also building a really cool community. There's discussions going on, ideas being shared. It's really a lot of fun. There's some new people that have joined. I want to give them a shout out real quick. Let me read through these as fast as I can. Alex Henselka, Riley Fisher, Jake Barner, Carl Hayes, Jack Jones, Chase Klo, Little Flirt, uh, Jeremy Harris, Marvin Farvadin, Joe Bader, Luke Addison, Joseph Gresham, Ryan Anthony, Joe Fisher, Riaz, Rob Dorsey, James E. Wagner Jr., David Danos, Sam Root, Rodrigo Gerardo, Ed Finch, Ben Harrison, Rob Jones, Philip Fuchs, and Jonas. Wow, that's a lot. Thank you guys so much for joining. I welcome you. If you would like to join them and get access to cool perks that nobody else gets to see, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. Leave comments down below and join a discussion. And if this is your first time here, I invite you to check out some of my other videos. And if you enjoy them, please do subscribe. I come back with videos just like this every Monday. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out, have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.